handful of sworn evidence to the FBI. But immediately, the videotape testimony was leaked to a hostile local media. The media immediately started discrediting the witnesses. They were, um, the witnesses came across in the media, in the Omaha World Herald, especially as the criminals. The last three victim witnesses were demolished by the press, particularly the Omaha World Herald. The paper never looked for information that would support any of the allegations. The whole purpose of the stories was to destroy any credibility that these youth may have. I've heard that people said that Gary Caridori coached me and uh, that he told me what to say, but the fact was I didn't meet Gary Caridori until way after I'd already talked to the Omaha police about the abuse and had named all the same people. Paul Bernassi maintains that neither the FBI nor the Omaha police took his allegations seriously. And they didn't ask me very much about Larry King or, Al uh, or even uh, Alan Bear at all. They treated the allegations that I made about the, about the people who abused me almost like a joke. The stories were of such significance that the investigators first wanted to prove the accuracy of the stories. As they said about the investigation of the three, initially three, and then a fourth person were telling the stories, as the investigation developed, it became obvious to the investigators that the information was not accurate, that in fact it was an entire conspiracy of allegations, none of which had any truth to them. I was very disappointed with the way uh, the FBI and law enforcement treated the victims. They, in fact, uh, turned them into the offenders, so to speak. And instead of taking the evidence that was delivered to them by the victims and interrogating the persons whom the victims identified, uh, they seemed to bear down and try to get the victims to change their story. It seemed to the investigators that the establishment of Omaha was closing ranks. Then Troy Bonner was brought in for questioning by the FBI. The FBI's attitude was, you know, just no. This, these kind of things don't happen. From the first interview when I went, you know, and realized they don't believe the fucking thing I'm saying, you know, I mean, they are, I mean, they, they were just appalled, but I realized what that, that look in their eye was back then. It was fear. It was fear of them, you know. I mean, I had witnessed, you know, firsthand things that would, you know, destroy this city, you know, people, or the position, you know what I mean? It's not going to be believed, believed, they said. It will not be believed. You will be found guilty of perjury. And you, I mean, they weren't telling me maybe. You know, they were saying, uh, it's, you're not, if there's no way. You're going, you go on with the story, you're going to jail. I mean, that was said to me direct. Troy Bonner agreed to withdraw his videotape testimony. The FBI used Troy in an attempt to persuade fellow witness Alicia Owen into abandoning her evidence about Larry King's nationwide network of powerful pedophiles. We have obtained the recording of the phone call made by the FBI on March the 9th, 1990. It is significant evidence for John DeCamp. This is Special Agent Michael F. Mott. Following will be a consensually recorded telephone call between Troy Boner and Alicia Owen. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hey, what's going on? I'd like to ask you that. <laughs> talk to me. No, you talk to me. I don't understand why you're lying. Why are you lying? What are you talking about? That's what I'm asking you. You're calling me why I'm why I'm lying? Yeah. You can talk to this whole thing, Alicia. You're full of shit. Either tell me what's going on. You're full of shit. Hey, look. Who do you have listening on the phone? I have nobody listening to me. I'm listening to you, and I'm hoping you'd give me some fucking answers. I'll be honest with you. I don't know what kind of game you're playing. I'm not trying to play a game. I'm not going to go to jail for you. And that's what's going to happen. Why would you go to jail? Jail for telling the truth? No, jail for lying. What have you lied about? I haven't lied. Okay, but why are you... Listen, shut up. Listen to me. You're not out here being talked to him every day. The pressure's kind of hard. Literally. 
have to have bricks for brains to take on the FBI in this country. And that's exactly what you have to do to do this properly. They now, in my opinion, in my investigation, are the architects of the cover-up. We asked the FBI in Omaha for an interview about its investigation of the Franklin scandal. Larry Holmquist for the FBI here. We feel it would, it would be inappropriate for us to comment. We work this with the Omaha Police Department. We just don't feel it would be appropriate for us to make comments. As the investigators sought out new witnesses, they found themselves under constant threat. Gary was threatened several times. His, his vehicles were tampered with. I would think whoever tampered with them, um, it was a scare tactic because it was so obvious that they were being tampered with. Gary got his, there was one piece of evidence I know he got that he was, that he even said he, he got one step ahead of him this time. He told us about this book and it was like addresses, telephone numbers, names. He said if, if, they, uh, if they knew he had it, they'd kill him. On July the 11th, 1990, Gary Caradori and his eight-year-old son, AJ, were flying home from Chicago in his light aircraft. They had watched the all-star baseball game, and Caradori had been pursuing new leads. Investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board are in Harold Cameron's cornfield, trying to determine what caused this private plane to crash, killing its two occupants. bodies of Gary Caridori and eight-year-old AJ were found in the wreckage. National Transportation Safety Board investigators say wreckage from the crash is apparently strewn over a three-quarter to one mile long stretch in this field. The, the fact that the wreckage is scattered over a, a large area certainly demonstrates that it did break up in flight. The exact mechanism of breakup yet is still unknown. The federal investigation was never able to discover what tore the plane apart. There are things missing from the plane. His briefcase is missing. I think the plane was sabotaged. There's no doubt in my mind. Within 24 hours of the tragedy, all Caradori's records were impounded by the FBI. Gary's widow, Sandy, is still unable to come to terms with her loss. As a mother, I don't want to ever think that somebody murdered my child let alone my husband. But I think if you'd ever talk to any parent, be it mother or father, who's ever lost a child, I mean, the worst thing that you can think of is that somebody would want to murder a child. I really feel that somebody killed my brother. And uh, inside me, I, I know that somebody killed my brother. If somebody could help us out somewhere, somebody knows something, and uh, may, uh, may God help those who did that to him and his family. The effect of Gary's crash on the investigation, I think, in effect, put an end to any, anybody else coming forward. There are many victims. We knew of more. There are more. They're still out there. They're afraid to come forward. That's when I was finished, because I figured out if they murdered Gary and his son, there was nothing that would stop them. There was no piece of paper. There was nothing we could come up with that was going to get anything done. But Gary Caradori's death pricked Troy Bonner's conscience. He promised Sandy that he would tell...